I've had the wonderful opportunity of speaking to our next guest on at least one, if not two occasions, since I came to Nashville some one year and one half ago. Uh, Dr. Carol Swain um, is a distinguished senior fellow for constitutional study with the Texas Policy uh, Public Policy Foundation. Um, she has served in a variety of capacities to include a political science uh, professor as well as a professor of law. Uh, she served a full professorship at Vanderbilt University, and uh, she has written a book called The Adversity of Diversity. And she joins us on the Matt Murphy Hotline to talk about that new book and how you can uh, how you can grab it. Hey, Dr. Swain, how are you? I am doing great. I have had a busy morning, and I'm thrilled to be speaking with you and your audience. Well, it's a pleasure to have you right here in Nashville. Um, it's a pleasure that you're in Nashville. It's wonderful to speak with you. And I think it's wonderful that you have made the decision to write a book. And I guess we start with this. What inspired you to write Adversity of Diversity? My concern about uh, what was taking place in America, I saw that with the DEI and CRT that they had become so aggressive with a total disregard of our country's civil rights laws and its equal protection clause of the Constitution. And the racism against whites and Asians had reached levels that I never anticipated. But also I saw that the DEI, CRT programs that corporations were pouring billions of dollars into, there was no value added. And I've been very concerned about this for a number of years. In fact, about five years ago, I started a book, which I didn't finish, that diversity programs are all wrong because they actually produced the opposite of what they claim to be about. They only brought about divisiveness. And part of that is because they are really deeply rooted in Marxism. And Marxism is a conflict, you know, based um, theory and worldview that can never bring about any kind of healing or any calmness. It's all about chaos. Well, it, it, it seems to be. Uh, let me let me back up just a minute and ask you this: Did you did you begin writing the book prior to the the recent decision regarding race and uh, college and university admissions, the Supreme Court decision? Had you started the book by then, or or were you in the midst of it, or was that part of the inspiration? <laughs> well, the the Supreme Court taken those two cases, one from the University of North Carolina and the and the other from Harvard involving uh, Asian students, students for fair admissions, I knew that that was important. But maybe five years ago, I had started a book I did not finish titled um, Why, Diversity, Why uh, Diversity Programs Are All Wrong. And so that book I abandoned. But this book, I started it uh, this spring. And I have a co-author, Mike Toll, who is, used to be a sports writer for the Tennessean, and he's a white male, a few years younger than I am, but he's experienced uh, discrimination because of the color of his skin. And I feel that God has sort of raised me up to be a civil rights advocate for all persons right now because it hurts my heart. In fact, my book is dedicated to America's children when I see white children shamed and bullied because of the color of their skin. And we have many white uh, college students or young adults and they are ashamed of their skin color. They are ashamed of the race they were born in. And I, we all know as Americans that we should never shame or bully anyone because of the color of their skin. With the DEI, CRT programs in many places, that's how they, uh, the officers, the sensitivity trainers, that's how they start off. Uh, that's part of their playbook. You know, I... I, I want to catch us up to today, but I'm I'm curious, Dr. Swain, your thoughts on whether or not affirmative action programs ever had a place in American society. I mean, obviously, we've had a lot of racial discrimination in our past. We've repaired so much of that. Do you believe that there was a time for racial uh, affirmative action and that time has passed or was it always a violation of the 14th Amendment, in your opinion? Well, there are two things. One is it was John F. Kennedy that issued the first executive order banning discrimination in certain uh, industries. And then Lyndon Johnson had his um, uh, executive orders 
Richard Nixon, a Republican, was the one that brought about quotas. I believe that the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibited discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, and religion, was badly needed. And I benefited from the passage of that legislation because it opened up uh, equal opportunity, which meant that there were people who began actively recruiting groups that had been left outside the mainstream. And so I've benefited from non-discrimination, equal opportunity, recruitment. And the recruitment included like a search for talented individuals. But I myself was a high school dropout. I started at a community college. I made the dean's list a couple of times there. I went on to a four-year college, predominantly white college, working full-time. I graduated magna cum laude. I was one of about 20 blacks on campus, and my first undergraduate paper was written uh, about affirmative action, my major paper, and I got an A-plus on it, and I was critical of affirmative action back in 1983. Uh, I saw the problems with it. I saw how it created anger among whites, but also that that uh, for blacks, there were two groups that I encountered. One was the entitlement group that said, uh, I'm going to law school, I'm going to medical school because they have to let us in. The students I was talking with had grade point averages below 1.0, but they were thinking that because of their race, they had to let them in. Another group of blacks I encountered were people that felt like without affirmative action, we can't do anything. We can't compete. And I never agreed with that, and I've always tried to compete with the best. In fact, uh, when I was on the job market for university positions, I would not apply for a minority position where you would invite, an uh, institution would invite three minorities, they would uh, compete against one another. I would not do that. The author of the book, The Adversity of Diversity, is with us, Dr. Carol Swain. Obviously, she lives in Nashville, had taught for years at uh, Vanderbilt University. I'm curious if you feel like you personally benefited at some point in your life from programs that would be loosely defined as affirmative action, and, and if so, how all of that changed you or how it changed in the in the aftermath of you benefiting from it? Well, I mean, again, I think that what I benefited the most from was the non-discrimination and the outreach. And um, when it comes to, I think about, okay, scholarships that I received, I know that the American Political Science Association had a scholarship, uh, three scholarships awarded to outstanding minorities. I got one of those scholarships. I got one from the Ford Foundation. And so those scholarships were targeted for racial and ethnic minority, so that certainly benefited me. But when I look at the places I've gone and the things that I've done, like, you know, I got early tenure at Princeton, so did a lot of white people. I got early tenure because my first book won three national prizes. It's been cited by the U.S. Supreme Court. I had outside offers from other institutions offering me uh, tenure, so Princeton had to make a decision uh, whether or not they wanted to promote me or let me go and get an endowed chair or uh, tenure at another institution. So I got tenure, and then when Vanderbilt hired me, I was promoted to full professorship. And in academia, if you're hot, you're hot. <laughs> and so there were plenty of <laughs> plenty of offers. And when I was hired by Princeton, I got a signing bonus, but then – Every hot shot got a signing bonus. Everywhere I went, I got offers and signing bonuses. And, you know, like I was a hot commodity in my day. But I've always learned, excuse me, I've always leaned conservative on these issues because I thought I was that good. I never felt like I wanted to crutch. But I can tell you, one thing I don't like about affirmative action is that if you're a racial and ethnic minority, no matter what you accomplish, they will always say, well, it's because of affirmative action. Mm -hmm. She got it because of affirmative action. So I won the highest prize a political scientist in America can win. Uh, at the time, it was the Woodrow Wilson Prize. They may have renamed it. I don't know. But if you were a white male, 
and you were awarded that prize, you were set for life. It was the Nobel Prize for political scientists. When I received it, um, I'm sure that it was discounted by, you know, four or five figure because I was black. And so that's what I've, I've experienced, that no matter how accomplished you are, if you're black, not only will black people tell you it was because of affirmative action, white progressives will tell you that as well. You know, I want you to compare the two. Affirmative action for one, and obviously now the, the United States Supreme Court in a 6-3 to three decision has struck down these admission practices by several of these universities. We're seeing less and less of that, and, and I think the time has come to see uh, a, a lack of picking and choosing based on conditions of one's birth for college admissions. But the DEI programs, the diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, this is, to me, like professionalized or corporate affirmative action. Am I looking at that right? Well, it's a layer imposed upon old-fashioned uh, affirmative action, which from the very beginning White people saw it as reverse discrimination, preferential treatment. They were willing to tolerate it. And for the longest time, you may, if you mentioned civil rights, white people thought, oh, that's something that applied to minorities. No more. I think when the DEI programs and the CRT programs became so aggressive that you had just outright blatant discrimination against white people, white people started eventually filing lawsuits, winning lawsuits, and so people are filing lawsuits, and they're learning how, how to document discrimination. And I think it's important for people to document discrimination, to exercise their rights to file lawsuits against employers and organizations and places where they are being shunned because of their religion or because of their race or ethnicity. And so, so affirmative action, many people were willing to tolerate that. And some of the aggressive DEI programs are coming about because of ESG, the environmental social governance that's being pushed uh, by, um, you know, the entities like BlackRock. That's, that's a part of what's taking place. But uh, the EEOC, the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, that was put in place by executive order, they very, they very often would go after companies, and it results in uh, situations like in New York City. Now, I'm not 100%, 100% sure it was EEOC, but there was a judge that ordered a black man who had failed the teacher's exam numerous times. Uh, he was found... Uh, to be a victim of racial discrimination, he was awarded $2 million for his inability to pass the teacher's exam in New York. That was recently. Mm. And apparently, blacks and Hispanics had a pass rate of maybe 50% or 52%. They were passing, but not at the same rate as white people. That was deemed discrimination. And when you look at how bad education is in America, you would want the best and brightest to be teachers, no, the left uh, only thinks about groups, and they think about race and ethnicity and sexual identity and all of these non-qualifiers that you see highlighted in the Biden administration. That's what they focus on, and I believe that DEI has been the ruin of the U.S. military because all of a sudden the military is not about protecting Americans against foreign and domestic enemies. It's about social engineering. It's, it's about drag parties. It's about... Uh, transgenderism. It's about everything but having an efficient machinery for protecting the nation. And so DEI is sinister. It's rooted in Marxism. Uh, many corporations are quietly backing away from it. And I think more need to back away from it. But also in my book, The Adversity of Diversity, I talk about a better way. We can return to the uh, the nation's motto, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Uh, we can have knowledge of civil rights protections because we do have protections, uh, and we can also have team teammanship. We can get back to the business of business, companies focusing on their original mission rather than social engineering, and some of this divisiveness because we are pitting groups against one another 
that needs to be uh, uh, jettisoned, and we need to focus on the golden rule, pretty much. Treat other people the way you want to be treated, and if you did, there wouldn't be so much conflict and discrimination in the workplace. And I guarantee you, if you end discrimination on the basis of race, you're not going to have lily white institutions. Racial and ethnic minorities were um, were making it before DEI became so aggressive. And uh, in schools that did not discriminate against blacks before affirmative action, they had black people among their alumni. Dr. Carol Swain is with us for just a moment or two longer. Her book is The Adversity of Diversity. It's available online at all major booksellers right now. You know, the last part of that answer there gives me some hope, Dr. Swain, because I was going to ask you, and you kind of answered it right there, if you're hopeful that we are close to achieving the colorblindness uh, that, you know, the great Martin Luther King talked about in many of his addresses, um, it it feels sometimes like there are more racial hucksters and shakedown artists and people that live on the issue of race now more than ever. But I feel like that this is dying out. I, I feel like that DEI is on the way out as well. And and a little bit of your answer there leads me to believe that you might feel the same. Yeah, the book is, is one goal is to, is to provide an off ramp for people that want to do it a different way, they want to do it the right way, and we don't have to discriminate against any group to be able to achieve a diverse workforce. And as far as my book, it can be purchased locally at Logos Books that's in Green Hills, and there are signed copies there, and I can personalize copies for anyone that wants to go to Logos Books in Nashville. Well, we encourage you to go there and buy local, and we encourage you to support wonderful thinkers like Dr. Carol Swain. Uh, Dr. Swain, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Congratulations on the book. I can't wait to grab a copy and read it myself. It's called The Adversity of Diversity. And once again, you can find it at many of your booksellers to include Logos Bookstore here locally in Nashville. Come see us sometime, doctor. We appreciate you. 